Hello, everyone, and welcome to Friday. Uh, this is Friday, September 27th, 2019. Um, I am Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Now, if I seem to be a little bit more disorganized than I normally am in the first 30 seconds of an episode, um, it's because... We have a whole lot of news today, and I was working to pull together my notes up until the very last possible second, and I'm still working to open them up on my iPad. So while I do that, I'm going to remind all of you that we bring you this show as well as all of our other um, episodes of The Daily Space, most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern which is 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. London time. We uh, don't just bring you the daily space. We also do Sunday Science Hour, and we co-stream shows like, well, Astronomy Cast, which will be coming out later today at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Um, but right now, right now, the reason we are here is astronomy news and oh my goodness oh my goodness so many really complicated cool stories to bring you and the first story that we have is one that takes a look at <sighs> we thought we understood how we got from the beginning of the universe to modern day, but it turns out we weren't as right as we thought we were. And this is gonna be an ongoing theme for today. So we have amazing computer models that allow us to basically throw into a software box all the stuff of the universe according to our current observations and set up the physics as we believe it was at the moment that all the atoms uh, separated out from the energy in the universe and the light flew free, setting up the cosmic microwave background. We have models that takes all that information and then spins it all forward to match what we see observationally in our modern universe. Now, while these models do an excellent job at taking what we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation, taking what we see observationally now and in the most recent few billion years, um, we have new observations that say we had some of the first details not entirely right. And these first details have to do with how quickly structures were able to form in our early universe. I, we assumed that it would take time for material to gravitationally come together in the kinds of densities needed to start forming stars, to start forming galaxies, to start forming galaxy clusters. But, well, some galaxy clusters are overachievers and have to prove us wrong by forming faster and more spectacularly than we had ever anticipated. New data coming to us through a consortium of observatories, uh, data that comes from the Gemini telescope, the Keck telescopes, uh, Subaru. Uh, all of this data together has identified a new proto-galaxy cluster. Um, it is named because, again, astronomers really shouldn't be allowed to name things. It is named Z660D, Z660D. Um, this particular system, it is already fairly well formed 13 billion light years away. So when we look at it, its light travels 13 billion years to reach us. And I already said it, actually. What I meant was light takes time to travel. We're looking at an object 13 billion light years away. Its light has been traveling for 13 billion years. And that tells us 
this system is order of 500 million years old. And at 500 million years, it already has 12 galaxies. It already has star formation. It already has structures. And that's pretty darn zippy. There is one other system that's been identified that is almost this old, but it's a hundred years. Um, it, it had reached the structure a hundred million years more recently in our universe. So this is the earliest we have seen a proto-galaxy forming in our universe. Now, you may be thinking 12 galaxies doesn't seem like all that much to write home about. But first of all, we're only seeing the most massive galaxies in the system because it is so far away and it is so amazingly faint. This area on the sky appears to be 15 times denser than any of the other observed regions that are observed at the same epoch in time. So we're looking at something that is significantly more dense and is significantly more structured than we've seen elsewhere. And it's the kind of thing we just hadn't anticipated. Our models hadn't expected. And the question starts to become, is this a once in the universe kind of massive, this is the first thing that ever formed? Or is this something that's more common? Not common, but something that occurs maybe one in every hundred clusters. We don't know, and more data is needed. Making this even more amazing to me is just that age, the system between the formation of the cosmic microwave background radiation about 400,000 years after the universe formed, and when we see this, Depending on whose age models you're looking at for the universe, we're looking at five to eight hundred thousand, or sorry, five five hundred to eight hundred million years after the separation of the cosmic microwave background. We have gone from the universe as a smooth, dense gas cloud to this system has formed. And we're looking at stars that are comparable to like the Hyades cluster for the oldest ones. These are still forming systems. These are systems where only the most massive of stars have had chances to evolve off the main sequence. We are seeing pretty much as young a system as can exist. Now, this is the kind of science that we've been looking forward to doing for ages. We thought we were going to have to wait until the James Webb Space Telescope launch to be able to do this kind of science. But it turns out that if you work carefully and you do it the slow, hard way, you can do it with a great deal of difficulty from the surface of our planet using the Northern Hemisphere's most massive telescopes. And this is kind of amazing. Now, we'll be able to do more, we'll be able to do things more easily, and JWST will revolutionize our understanding of the early universe, but we don't have it yet. And this shows us we don't have to wait any longer for that kind of science, the kind that starts to fill in the details and tell us, oh, wait, no, you're wrong here. The universe can form protoclusters this early on after its formation. This is amazing science, and um, it's worthy of getting telescope time on all the Northern Hemisphere's largest telescopes. And I feel okay saying all, because it's on its way to getting telescope time on the Atacama Large Millimeter Array to continue doing um, deep detail work looking to see are there dust and shrouded galaxies that haven't been detected yet? What is the dust gas density in this system? And over time, I see so many observations in this cluster's future. So that is our first story for today. And as we continue our science, I'm going to bring you a little bit closer to home, but not too much closer to home. Our next story is yet again a story of, huh, that's not what we thought we would see.
And in this case, what we're looking at quite accidentally is the outer halos of a galaxy. Galaxies are, are made up of multiple compartments multiple constituent parts. There is, uh, for disk galaxies like our own Milky Way, that disk of stars that you see. Then there is that spheroid of stars that surrounds the supermassive black hole. Uh, in elliptical galaxies, that's all you've got is that spheroid of stars. And then there's constituent dust and gas, which is believed to expand out into a massive halo that in some cases is just nearly impossible to see because it's cold gas. But it's cold gas that was thought to have a turbulent velocity structure. So it was thought to have a lot of motion going on out there. But trying to measure that material isn't something we can do easily. It's, it's not really giving off light. And primarily when we're trying to study the outer halos of galaxies, one of the best ways we can do it is to look for those chance alignments of one galaxy in front of another on the sky. And by shining the way, by studying the way background light shines through a four gallon galaxy, we can begin to, well, see things we'd never otherwise see as they're illuminated by that background light. Now, finding those systems is hard, but Recently, one such alignment was discovered entirely by chance. Uh, astronomers using the Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder telescope down in Australia were looking for fast radio bursts. These are pulses of radio emission that are extremely brief, extremely bright, and we really don't have any idea. Well, we have ideas, but we really don't have any knowledge hard and fast and what is causing these bursts of energy. And we're finally just starting to get the ability to pinpoint where on the sky these bursts of energy are coming from. Well, in looking with the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope at one of the fast radio bursts that had been pinpointed, astronomers discovered that it appeared to come from a background galaxy and that fast radio burst's light appeared to have passed through a closer galaxy's halo. And because this was an extremely brief burst of light measured in tens of milliseconds in duration, the fact that we saw such brief bursts indicated that the velocities of the gas in that intervening galaxy had to be pretty low. If the gas had had a large velocity, interactions between the gas and that light would have spread out the colors of the light, would have spread out the, the pulse. And what we saw didn't match what would have happened with that turbulent gas. Now, beyond that, it also indicated that that outer halo probably doesn't have a magnetic field worth talking about because there was no magnetic field affecting that radio burst's light either. So now we're seeing a picture of the outer halo of a galaxy that again is not what we expected. It doesn't really have a magnetic field. It is cool, quiet, calm gas. The press releases kept using the word tranquil. Uh, so now we need to think differently about how we see galaxies. And that too is awesome. But wait, there is more. Our story of how the heck did that get to happen does not stop here. But before we go to the next story, I want to point out one of the things that amused me far more than it should have this morning. This is one of the illustrations that came with the press releases for this story. Um, in it, you see the background galaxy that is the source of the fast radio burst. You see the foreground galaxy the burst went through. You see a graphical version of what the fast radio burst would have looked like. And it is hitting our galaxy in the lower right. Cool. Now, when press releases come out from multiple institutions, we often see the same illustrations getting used multiple times, or we see radically different illustrations from different institutions. What we don't normally see is extremely similar illustrations from different institutions, but today it is decided to be different. 
This is another illustration, again, with a background galaxy, a foreground galaxy, our galaxy, and the line of light from the fast radio burst. And here they show a completely different representation of the fast radio burst. Um, and between the two of them, it's just like the tilts change, the structures of the galaxies are close to the same, but not identical. Um, these are the things that journalists live to be amused by. If you're going to be amused, this is the right thing to be amused by. Anyways, on to our next story. And this is one that you may have already heard because it has been taking over social media. This is the story of a small dwarf star, red dwarf star, that has a massive planet. Now, as we're going to discuss in detail later today on Astronomy Cast, anyone who tells you they know how planetary systems form, they are either overestimating their own knowledge or just plain lying to you. We have vague hand wavy notions of how solar systems form. We do not understand the details. And our even hand wavy models said that tiny stars should have very tiny planets in large numbers. And this particular idea has been supported by observations of things like the TRAPPIST-1 system where you have a whole fleet of little tiny planets orbiting the little tiny star. But no, this system, which has the poetic name of GJ3512, had to prove us completely wrong. In this particular system, they have a star roughly a tenth the size of our star that is orbited by a Jupiter. This gives us roughly a factor of 10 in size difference between the planet and its star. And this kind of mass ratio is just not something we expected to see because the way we thought these systems formed was you have the star forming in the center with collapsing material. The collapsing material is spinning around it and it fragments into small pieces that build up to form smaller worlds as compared to the mass of the star. And this bottom up creation of planets by combining small things into bigger and bigger is how you get lots of tiny planets. But the kind of disk of material that should exist around a red dwarf star doesn't have enough material in it for this kind of a solution to get us to this big of a planet, which suggests that maybe just like we're learning that some galaxies form from small things building up and other galaxies form by just everything going whoomp and forming a giant structure all at once, there may be both a bottom-up and a top-down formation model for solar systems where sometimes as that solar system forms, the cloud of, the cloud of dust and gas that is collapsing to form the star fragments. And one of those fragments, in this case, just formed a planet. Now, this is similar to how we see binary star systems forming, where you have one giant cloud of molecular glass, gas that fragments into multiple systems, and you can have it fragment into two co-orbiting, co-rotating stars. Well, in this case, it's thought maybe what they had was one cloud collapsed to form a star, a red dwarf star. And another collapsed down to form a Jupiter going around it. Now, this raises the question, is it possible to get Jupiters forming all by their lonesome in the leftover dregs of collapsing molecular clouds? We don't know. These are the things that we're going to have to keep looking, keep studying. And as we get more and more data, 
we're going to be able to stop going, okay, we have the one solar system we live in. Let's predict planetary formation from that. Okay, wait, no, we've found five more systems. Let's redo our model. Okay, we now have one system with a red dwarf. Let's design all of our models to match that. This is how we've been doing it based on not a lot of data. Well, it's a new age. We're getting more and more data. And that more and more data will hopefully bring us closer and closer to maybe actually having a model that matches reality. This is what we're trying to do. This is always the goal of science, to figure out how to match reality. And that is our last story for today. And I am now going to take your questions and uh, while you type them in, I'm going to remind all of you to please uh, precede your question with the circle, with the star in it, and that will make it much easier for me to find them. Uh, we are a production of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are produced by Susie Murph, who keeps this show going and is responsible for so much of the stuff that you see around here. Uh, this channel also is co-hosted by Annie Wilson, and we get special help from Paranor when we're co-streaming shows uh, such as the Astronomy Cast podcast, which we will be co-streaming later today. So, um, that's all I've got. And uh, I'm going to now look to see what questions you have for me today. Scrolling... Walker started the chat with the word moo. I don't know why that amuses me, but it really does. Um, everyone's commenting that Twitch looks different. Um, currently, it's TwitchCon in San Diego, which means lots of updates to the system. Um, oh, man, I've forgotten to unmute myself 102 times, according to Nightbot. Ah. <sighs> Some things are hard to remember. Hello, Pantene DK. I don't think I've seen you here before. Welcome. Um, scrolling. Looking for questions. Hello, the gem doctor. If you use BTTV, you can change the font. I don't know what that is. Okay, looking, looking, I love the love affair between Nightbot and uh, Astro B. Where did all of the Big Bang denying come from today? No, Big Bang is a real thing. Sorry, I'm looking for questions and you're being very deeply confusing today. Okay, OpenCage5 asks, so is the answer to the question of the very first stars a bell curve now? As in, could this be, could there be this early, but probably more like? Um, so I think what you're getting at is early in the universe, there was just a few stars starting to form and then it peaked. And then since then, the rate of star formation has been going down. I don't think it's really a bell curve. I think the shape is radically different from a bell curve. But that idea that a few stars turned on, more stars turned on, and then you had star formation early in the universe. And since then, we've been just going downhill ever since. Um, I do think that's an accurate way of looking at it. Just don't, don't look for a nice symmetric bell in the distribution. Uh, just like actual grade curves, are usually not bells. Um, looking, <laughs> a burst of energy, a Wookiee missed his target. That could be true. Uh, looking to see what else is in here. I'm just going to scroll for questions and not read as much because you guys are deeply confusing. Oh, there aren't that many other questions today. Wow, we are a largely question-free kind of day. But we have a sub from Susie Murph. Everyone get your emotes out. Come here, Eddie. And we're going to thank you with cuteness because this is how we thank people. Come here. 
Hi, hi. This is Eddie, the Australian Shepherd of Astronomy. And when you give us bits and subs, we give him, well, bits. Someday maybe I will give him a sub when we get a sub. It just has to be the right sub. Okay. Um, hello, Johnny the Carrot. Um, so Johnny the Carrot asks, uh, how did matter come to be before the Big Bang? Well, there wasn't matter before the Big Bang. And in, in fact, by all definitions we have, you can't really discuss the universe before the Big Bang because there wasn't time, there wasn't stuff. Initially, our entire universe was just energy emerging out of a singularity that we don't really have the language to describe, except mathematically. And it was out of that singularity and out of that energy that everything that is our modern universe came into existence. And one of the things we don't think about often enough is energy and mass really are the exact same thing in different formats, the same way um, ice and liquid can both be water. Um, energy and mass are these same stuffs. So it was out of the expanding energy of our universe that all the mass that we experience today was more or less eventually formed. Now, some of it, some of it has been recycled along the lines where stuff has gone back into being energy and recycling happens, but it was out of that pure energy, early universe that mass essentially froze out. Um, I don't know if that was a satisfying answer, but that's the reality of it. Um, so Susie's pointing out, question from the time path. Will I be a part exactly mixed in a black hole in many billion years later? Um, so one of the cool things about our universe is uh, black holes don't go around just randomly gobbling things up. So the real question starts to become, what is the probability in the fullness of time that through interactions with other stuff in our galaxy, the atoms that are part of you today will get consumed into something else that eventually becomes a black hole or is already a black hole. And from what I understand, the probabilities are pretty good of things slowly getting swept up into more and more black holes in the fullness of time. So we're not necessarily talking billions of years here. We're talking trillions of years. And then once the majority of things are black holes and we don't have cosmic microwave background radiation in a large enough amount to sustain those holes, they're going to be able to evaporate away, allowing whatever fell into them to become part of the rest of the universe again. Uh, it's a slow poetic end to our universe, but the odds are good that the atoms that are in you will, in the fullness of time, well after they've already been recycled into multiple generations of worm food, tree food, star food, other food, um, they will become the food of a black hole. Uh, looking to see what else is here. Um, Walker asks, could there be a bunch of Jupiter-sized failed stars floating out there alone? Yes. And that is sad and beautiful. Um, yeah, that is entirely possible. We Now, that doesn't mean it is so. It just means from our limited current understanding it's a possibility. Uh, looking for more questions. So Johnny the Carrot asks, doesn't Hawking radiation cause weirdness? Um, we don't know enough about it yet to, to say what is and isn't weird. Um, we're just kind of in the eyes of the beholder. The idea of Hawking radiation is we know that energy um, is periodically just spontaneously forming particles, a 
um, a particle and its antiparticle, actually. And these pretty much instantaneously form and then go away. But if one of them forms outside an event horizon with the correct velocity and the other one forms inside an event horizon, they're not going to recombine back into pure energy. So you're going to have the energy of one of those two particles leave the black hole, making it smaller. Now, the majority of the black holes we have today, by which I mean all of them except for maybe some primordial ones, uh, are constantly getting inundated with cosmic rays, with cosmic microwave background light, with stuff. And that prevents them from being able to evaporate away because the rate at which things are falling in exceeds the rate at which they could evaporate away. But there are other possibilities when the universe starts to wind down. Okay, looking to see what other questions. Um, Walker is um, discussing food. There is a discussion of food. Um, so much food. You guys just like to torture me knowing I will go eat my lunch now. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Are you, or are you simply going to discuss your food in front of me? Um, because, okay, Johnny has one more. Go for it, Johnny. This is the, the hard part of hosting a Twitch stream, the, the waiting for questions to get typed in. I'm waiting. I'm waiting impatiently. OK, there we go. Um, so Johnny writes, so I learned that energy eventually all equalizes. Doesn't this mean that in the end, all energy will have equalized? Yes. Um, eventually through collisions um, and equalizing by radiating away energy, uh, our universe is pretty much going to be a extremely expanded fuzz of low energy energy. That's kind of a vague way of, it, it's going to be photons. Now, there could be some exceptions to this. We don't fully understand all of particle physics yet. And it is thought that protons will eventually decay into energy. But that hasn't been seen yet. And if protons don't actually decay, that means we can end up with mass still being left. So if the black holes don't eat everything up, you can still end up with random protons, random white dwarf stars that have cooled down to nothing more than cold, dark diamonds. Um, so there, there's options for high density and no density-ish things to still exist uh, in the background. Um, but the bulk of the universe will indeed just be a diffuse energy. It's not very satisfying. It is kind of poetic. Um, so Hexa Kosakoran asks, if music is the food of love, is then food the music of the body? I would have said dance is the music of the body, but I'm good to also say that food is. I'm kind of low-key that way. Uh, Walker uh, <laughs> is commenting that Annie makes um, them suffer about food all the time. Uh, so I'm just getting retribution. Oh. Open Cage asks, uh, which is the strong strongest epic for the first star forming? I'm not sure that we can really say right now. Um because we don't understand the first generation of stars well enough. That's the kind of thing that the JWST is going to be answered in fine detail. Uh, in general, I would uh, have to say um, long ago. Uh, I just can't say exactly when long ago. Um, I'm sorry. I just 
can't like my gut is saying 10 billion years ago at a minimum um but that's a gut and i really need to do more research and in the process of futzing i close twitch let's get it there it is we're back um Looking to see if there's other questions in here I missed. So Walker asks, um, oh, I already got Walker's question. Um, and that's awesome that you got to go visit CERN. Switzerland, I'm told, is stunningly beautiful. Um, okay, so that seems to be all we've got for today. Uh, as I said, we will be live streaming Astronomy Cast in an hour and a half at 3 p.m. Eastern. That is noon Pacific. Uh, next week, things are going to be a little wild and crazy around here. Uh, Monday should go just as normal, but on Tuesday, I will be doing the planes and automobiles thing to get myself from Southern Illinois all the way out to Tucson, Arizona. Uh, while I am flying through the air, uh, Annie Wilson will be here and you will be in her more than capable hands. Um, I should be broadcasting from the Planetary Science Institute headquarters in Tucson all next week. And a week from Saturday, that is October 5th, is International Observe the Moon Night. And all of you should try and find someplace local that you can get involved and going outside and looking up the same time everyone else in the world is invited. That doesn't mean they will be, but everyone else is invited to go outside and look up and look at this moon that we keep finding new ways to both explore and drop dead robots onto. Um, Mars used to be the great source of killing rovers, and now the moon apparently is trying to compete with it and kill its own fair share of spacecraft. Uh, so if you're in the Tucson area, I will be giving a talk at the Flandau Center on October 5th. And you're all invited. It's 7 p.m. at the Planetarium. Um, beyond that, we will start the week after that sometime next week. I can tell you there will be more than a normal amount of Annie, um, or we are considering taking one week off for this show. Um, still up in the air. So that's it. That's all I've got. We will be back not too long from now. And I am clicking all the wrong buttons because sometimes that's what I do. So um, wherever you are in the world, we are going to raid Oh Bother in just a moment. You guys have all the emotes um, because it's been September and you did an amazing job. And not just renewing your own subs, but giving them to others as well. So go, we will raid O Bother and fill his stream with all the spacey goodness. And I'll see you all in a little bit. But for now, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. Bye-bye.